Cool. That started recording. So if you would like to introduce yourself, that would be great. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Mandy Williams. I never like to go by age, but I think it's quite important for the conversation. I'm 48. Uh, I'm training for, well, I have done the higher up school championships, but I'm training again for that to try and achieve um, a world record when I'm 50. So I would describe myself as an athlete uh, and I was diagnosed autistic three years ago. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and for people who haven't heard of high rocks oh, yeah. do you want to describe it uh ooh. <laughs> i won't say it's like crossfit because the crossfitters get very grumpy and so do the high rocks people but it's like crossfit but it's basically eight 1k runs but after every 1k you do a station so one station is 100 meters of burpee projects one station is a thousand kilometers of row on the row machine 1000 meters of ski then you have to push a sled of 105 kilograms and pull a sled as well of 70 odd kilograms, throw 100 war balls of four kilograms, um, very high up target, especially when you're five foot two. So get the gist. <laughs> so it's basically a lovely 1K run broken up by these really mean sort of obstacles in the way. <laughs> I mean, it sounds perfect for like yeah. the ADHD neurodivergent brain. <laughs> yes. yes. And what's really nice is you know every station is the same every single time. So the thing with CrossFit, mm. so I love watching CrossFit. I wouldn't like to turn up and be told, this is what we're doing and not having prepared for it. So High Rocks really does appeal because every station is the same and it's all around the world, but it's always still the same, which is lovely. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you, I uh, don't know if you're similar, but for me, because I, I, my diagnosis is autism, I've, I've obviously got like a lot of, traits of ADHD, there's often a lot of crossover, but I find there's quite a juxtaposition between wanting consistency and predictability, but then also wanting variety and change. And yeah. so it sounds like Hyrox is providing both of those things. So you've got the comfort of knowing what's coming up, but you've also got variety so you don't get bored. Exactly. Um, so the training is the variety, you know, so like today, for example, I was doing um, 10 times 500 meters on the track, but tomorrow I'm pulling a sled. So yeah, I get the variety in the training, which is lovely, but you're right, every competition is the same. So that's really cool. Yeah. 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 Um, and so when did you get into sport? Because obviously you talked about your age and it's part of your story. You're wanting to inspire people, not only in regards to your neurodiversity, but in regards to like you're never too old to do or start anything. Yeah. Um, no, I got into sport really, really late in life. So um, I think a lot of us now, when we look back, especially knowing uh, that we're autistic, is that I was very really badly bullied at school because it was all team sports. It was all very social and I didn't want to do team sports. And now I know about my coordination uh, and I couldn't hit a tennis ball or I couldn't hit a hockey ball. And it was very predominantly that at my school. So I would hide. I always joke that I was substitute for the B team, which is the lowest of the low <laughs> I did no sport, um, which is annoying because that would have been very good actually now looking back. And then I had to pass a medical for the RAF um, because my special interest was flying for a while. So I didn't just look at aeroplanes, I learned to fly aeroplanes and <laughs> go to the RAF. Again, that's the story of my life with my special interest. Um, so I had to run really as well. So I learned to run. I didn't like it, did it but came back to it after my children were born just to get a little bit active. And then before I know it, it became special interest, marathons, ultra marathons. Did my first track race at the age of 45, <laughs> got silver medal. I'm like, where did that come from? And I even went, and you'll laugh at me, um, the wrong direction on the track. I even lined up the wrong way. <laughs> That's how naive I was. Um, so yeah, I was very, very late to sport, extremely late to sport. Uh, but always high energy. And I look back and I know as a 12-year-old child, I was running down the stairs in my house, yeah. you know, and, and I was dancing around with my walkman in those days. <laughs> I might not know what that was, but um, dancing to music and things like that. So I knew the energy was there, but I had no one to channel it, you know? Mm. So, yeah, very yeah. late. <laughs> and I'm interested to, it might just be the words that you used and there might be no meaning behind it, but you said... Um, you learned to run, yes. which actually to somebody else might sound a bit like, what do you mean you learned to run? Did you learn the, the, the physiology and the rules behind it? But I feel like you mean more you learned the movement of running because it doesn't come naturally to some. Oh, no. I, mean, I went into a rabbit hole of running. So I didn't learn to run. I learned to 
eat as a runner. I, I learned not to run, I learned to become a runner. Maybe that sounds a bit better. So I learned about what was good pacing, about how it should feel, how you should breathe, um, the technique, the diet, the mileage. It was a deep rabbit hole. So when I mean I learned to do something, I, I probably mean it was a, it just became, I don't like the word obsession, it's a bad word, but it became a very passionate thing for me. So yeah, I knew I could run, but I wanted to run at a really high level. If that makes sense? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I wonder like, because I kind of know it, we had a, a chat before this, so I know a little bit about your story. Um, and I know for me, uh, sometimes it takes a person or the influence of a person um, to make me feel comfortable enough and confident enough to be able to just go full in on something. And then I can take on the world after that, but I need that support structure or stability. And I'm just wondering, it sounds like you have a partner in crime in yeah. your husband, is it? It's my, no, it's not my husband yet. Um, but not no, yet. I don't actually, I don't, I don't. It, no, the opposite. So he is was uh, an elite runner, um, a high level. Um, but he wouldn't do nothing, but no, because I won't, I'm uncoachable. Let's put it that way. I do have a coach, but he's online and he knows about me. But I'm uncoachable because he tried to coach me. So he tried to even say, do this, do that. And I'm like, no, I'm not listening. I'm not listening to you at all. So it actually had the opposite effect. I think what I did like about it is that we had someone, a, a joint who we could talk about because he was into that special interest as well. Yeah. Um, so he was a positive influence. He understood why I was training, but he would tell me I could training too much. So actually it was the other way around. He'd be like, you're running too much. You don't need to run 80 miles a week. Calm it down. You're injured. Why are you limping around the track? You know, so we actually, it, it was the opposite effect. They actually, I didn't like it. <laughs> so, and I don't think I've ever had, which is the reason why I want to do this. I've never had a role model and that sounds awful, but I haven't ever had a role model. I've never had anyone that's invested the interest in me. And I get sad. I didn't want to get sad. I've never had anyone that's taken me aside and said, I believe in you. Let's do this. You've got this. It's always been from me. And do you think that that's because I I don't want to upset you? No, that's good. It's but fine. like, I think it's important to say it how it is. Yeah. Do you think it's because you come across a certain way, and like you say, you don't you don't like to listen to people, you don't like to be coached, and and for some people, they might interpret that as rude or dismissive and then you kind of get shut down whereas you know I don't know what the best way to interact with you would be but I'm guessing it would not be to just um you know you push back and then they say fine no <laughs> so <laughs> yes <laughs> I think if you can tell me why I'm doing something like so like my online coach is really good now he's, he's very good he's in Portugal though so he can't see what I'm doing all the time which is very handy but no, I do stick to the rules, but I will overtrain and I will do things. And I always feel like I know myself better than anybody else. And maybe because I haven't had someone be a full-time coach by my side, I've never experienced that. So it's almost a trust thing as well. Mm. Um, and I think like a lot of us, I masked for so many years and I had a lot of imposter syndrome. That I didn't tell people I was doing it. I didn't tell people I was training. I didn't tell people I flew planes. I didn't tell people I'd triathlon. I didn't tell people I ran marathons. It would pop into the conversations and people go, oh yeah, like when? They're like, are you? And then they wouldn't believe me. So I don't even tell people half the stuff I do, you know? So don't give them the chance to even learn about it and coach me and advise me, mm. you know? <laughs> there so it sounds like there's quite a lot of uh, trust issues there. Yes. Um, I'm trying not to make this into a counseling session. <laughs> <laughs> Having just fin finished my counseling qualification, <laughs> I just, I reminded myself of, of myself in those sessions then. It sounds like you have a lot of trust issues. <laughs> yeah, that, is, um, that is true. <laughs> but it yeah. does, and that is something that does need to be appreciated, isn't it? We talk about mm -hmm. um, intersectionality and things and, and the issues people have with demasking yes. but um and I know that people don't like the word trauma to be thrown around but I guess when you live a life that is to some degree a lie or a mask um or a half truth 
you do come across like a series of microaggressions every hour of every day and it does take its toll and it does kind of scar you a bit um but that being said i described you as why did i describe you as joyfully aggressive but you didn't yeah. like the aggressive bit but i turned into joy warrior now i like joy warrior. okay joy warrior <laughs> but you have you seem to be in the process of flipping that around and creating something positive and i wonder did that come from you getting getting a diagnosis and getting that understanding of yourself or is there something else you can describe humans having a default mode <laughs> um and my default mode is joy I've always been like this. I've always laughed. I've always felt happy. I, I'm happy in my own company, you know, with my dogs and training and doing my, I don't want to do anything to impress anybody. It doesn't interest me. I do what makes me feel joyful, which is even sport. Um, but I think I went through years of um, not long periods, but periods of depression. But when they do happen to me, they're very big. They're huge. Uh, but then they do burn out as well very fast. They're very explosive bouts. So for years and years, I thought it was just depression from things that happened to me, from experiences. Um, but because I was very independent, I always had this very attitude of pull myself together, get on with it. And I always managed to. Um, but I did have one particular bout that was particularly bad that my partner then just said, we'd speak to somebody. And without going too much into the story, but it was interesting. So when I went to speak to my GP about, I'd done my research and I thought, because I'd seen it in my son, my son, is autistic and I've seen it in him. And I said, you know, I'm stimming all the time. I didn't understand why I was stimming. I didn't understand these meltdowns. And he actually said to me, oh, I've known it all along. I've known <laughs> I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? Because <laughs> I didn't know, you know? So when I did get diagnosed, I think it wasn't necessarily un unpacked joy. That was always there. It unpacked this feeling that there was nothing wrong with my joy, if that makes sense. That I wasn't insane, that I wasn't this label that everyone calls me of eccentric and joyful and you know just cheeky energetic mandy suddenly i was like okay i can be taken seriously these bouts of depression are because i'm exhausted emotionally from from masking um and now i can be more joyful and just be me the first thing i did actually is i went out and bought a ghostbusters poster and put it on the wall because <laughs> i went back to my little eight-year-old mandy again when she didn't have anyone judging her at all mm, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so it's like almost as you grew up you started to realize or become aware of other people's judgment and expectations and then you had to move away from being yourself and towards the kind of socially accepted norm yes absolutely yeah totally so back to the ghost buses again it's all good <laughs> nice <laughs> i love that so like what do you think are the biggest barriers at the moment and i probably should caveat that with because I know this and the, the viewers don't that you um head up this um autistic women support group do you want to talk a bit more about that and um then we can talk about the barriers that you see um people facing well it's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer coordinator um for, for SWAN which is a Scottish Women's Autism Network but what happens with that is I actually wanted to bring some athletics into the, to, into the community to see if anyone was interested in learning to run and work in Scottish athletics and Jog Scotland and, and things like that. And it was interesting because when I spoke to everybody about that, everybody wanted to do the walking groups, but nobody wanted to do the running groups. And even though I was making it as accessible as possible and at a lower level, the same theme was coming through was that everybody can walk. But I don't know what level I'm at with running or sports, and I might get laughed at. Everyone says the same thing. I might get laughed at. And I, it came through to me all the time that that's why I never, well, I did join an athletics pod briefly, but I really struggled. I used to hide in the car and get upset. And that's those barriers, really. It's that it was very really social. It was like 20 minutes of standing around, warming up, talking to each other. And it was reminiscent of the school days again. I, I had no one to talk to, or I just wanted to train. I wanted to run. I was, I was ready to go, you know? I was caffeinated, let me loose. <laughs> and everyone stood around having a chat. And I'm like, I, I, I used to go back to the car and cry, but people wouldn't understand that. Um, or hide in a bush or wear a baseball cap. And then after the session, everyone would stand around and talk. And I was like, I want to go home now. And and I I when I speak to a lot of the people that were doing the running, 
that was very that was very true they were like look I want to train and if I'm going to train to get better at something I just want to do that one thing and if I wanted to socialize mm-hmm. I want to socialize so I think that's a big blocker to it really as well yeah um, and a lot of people like to train alone I know I certainly I go for my dog so I train alone you know mm-hmm. and I yeah that's probably the blockers I say yeah and I guess that's part of also people learn differently and people get distracted as well um I know for myself like if I my best learning environment is either independently or one-on-one mm. and so if I'm with a gr- big group of people I kind of get quite lost in it and quite distracted and it detracts from my ability to learn so I definitely get what you're saying there and but even listening to you, and I remember we had this conversation before and, and talked about the fact that there's some really simple, easy solutions to that. Like if you had have like hard starts for sessions and, you know, this information is sent out in advance and you can have a buffer time beforehand where if you're a really sociable person and you like that aspect, you can come early. And then, you know, the people who don't want to be as sociable and want to get on with the training, they can just slip in the door straight before the session and slip out again and yes. and that's inclusivity um but it's about people making environments and putting in structures whereby that can easily be put into place and utilized and also about people like you said not pointing the finger not making assumptions not laughing and just accepting that some people are different and and it might be that if there was a social gathering at the club, you would go to that. That would be compartmentalized yes. in the social time yes. and very yes. distinct from the training time. Yes. Um, totally. So, totally. And then there's things like as well, I know in advance, so for example, with my online coaching, we get our sessions on a Sunday night for the whole week. So I see what I'm going to do every single day. If I want to change it, I'm in full control, but no one's going to change that on me. No one's going to change those sessions for me. But I could turn up to an athletic club or a running club. And when I did set up the running or the walking group, I did send people out programs beforehand so they knew. And I do that with everything I do. Even if I interview people uh, for a role, I send them out the questions I'm going to ask and I never deviate. So they have that information beforehand. And it's the same with coaching and it's the same with sports. If, even if it's a week in advance and you know what you're going to do, you know, or plan B, even at the very least, if the weather's really bad, it's yeah. plan B. But if you don't know what you're going to do, you turn up there, you've got to do the social stuff and B, then you don't know what you're going to be doing. And then you, you're like, oh my heavens, you know, if it's mile reps, I'm already in a bad place, you know? So it's like, I don't want to do it. And then the other thing that nobody ever seems to talk about is swimming. I know that sport brings that out in me. So I know, for example, if I'm in the gym and it's a particularly busy time, sometimes if m ms on my headphones and I've done a really good sled push session and I'm feeling amazing, I'm going to dance on the spot, you know, or I'm going to flap my hands if I've done a really good pull-up session. Um, I remember watching my son once at the side of the triathlon pool when he was younger, and he was, he wasn't very impressive, he was flapping, he was stimming, and I watched it, and I was in those spectator stand watching his excitement, and I knew he was desperate to go, but I saw everybody else looking at him like, what, what is he doing? Mm-hmm. And he didn't see that, and I'm so glad he didn't, but I know people will see me in the gym sometimes, so I'll go very quiet times, um, so I can stim, if that makes sense, because we know we need to release that. And that's a big part of sports for me as well. And I even make, so when I used to do hill running, I'd run down the hills, I'm going to tell you, but I used to run down the hills, I'm really bad at the balance, but I used to run down going, way because I was excited, you know? I'd be flying, but I was really excited. And you can't yeah. control that in the time, you know? But you want to be very serious. Yeah, I like, I'd love to hear more about the stimming because I think I think either people who can't suppress it Mm. do it but they often can't communicate why they're doing it because perhaps they are higher support needs um not as capable of articulating their feelings but Obviously, there are people who are, may have lower support needs or are better at communicating and articulating their feelings, um, but they tend to suppress that mm. kind of behaviour and be ashamed of it and 
not talk about it, which is why it's very rare to come across someone like you who is incredibly articulate. What are you doing a physics degree at the moment? Just for a hobby. But you know, you kind of do it and embrace it. And I would love to know in more detail what it feels like, what it does for you, what happens if you suppress it, what it looks like on the outside. Yeah, I can't suppress it. I used to for years. I So I don't mind doing this. I think it should be talked about more and especially in sports. Um, so I tense up, I will hold a hand. I can't do it on demand. I'll hold a hand next to my face and I will literally tense my hand to the point I can hurt my wrist quite badly. Um, but I was told as a kid to sit on my hands. It was a habit, it was called. And I never knew what it was. Uh, and then I realized what it was. And it's an expression of joy for me. It's when I'm proud of something or feeling particularly joyful. It's overwhelming. It's a huge rush. And I also saw people that don't experience that because I thought everybody did. And I was like, wow, some people, like, you know, we always say we have voices in our heads. Like, some people don't have voices there. Some people aren't thinking about a thousand things at the same time. Some people aren't stimming with joy. And it was when I realized that not everyone did it that I thought, wow, okay. I do suppress it in public. Um, so again, my partner will spot me doing it. And he'll go, you're tensing up. And I'll go, oh yeah, he calls it tensing up. I go, I am, I am, I am. But I know you're not meant to stop. Um, but sometimes if <laughs> I park the car really well, I might do it when I'm driving. And, that's <laughs> you know, like, and he'll say, that face. I'm like, yeah, okay. Or if I feel myself sometimes doing a track session, I can see it in my face. And I'm on the GoPro and I'm like, well, I'm not showing that one on Instagram. <laughs> you know, so my face isn't very attractive. <laughs> but... I will not hide away from doing it anymore at my age now. I'm, I'm like, no, you know what? I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed, I'm good at what I'm doing now. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm not getting in anybody's way. If I do a little dance on the floor, like a little judge, because I'm happy I've done something, and that's my way of stimming about doing it full on, I'm going to do it. Because containing that is bad for me, you know? And I think it should be allowed. And I think it's an education thing. I think people need to understand why we do it, how it feels, you're right. Um, and how it's unhealthy to suppress that. You should never stop mm. someone from swimming. Um, and yeah, if I've managed to, for the first time ever, try and do a muscle up, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get happy about that. You know, that's an achievement for me at my age. So I'm going to do a little dance on the spot, you know, and stim. Because, yeah, I, and I, I think a lot of people, um, a lot of autistic people stim when they're anxious as well. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm guessing it just has something to do with an extremely strong emotion. Yes. So yes. it's like a, a physical response or a nervous system response to an extremely strong emotion. Yes. I don't tend to do when I'm personally me, I, I pace when I'm anxious. You can't stop me pacing. Uh, that's my anxiety manifests itself that way. Uh, it's usually when I'm very, very proud of something I've done very proud it can be a piece of art. It could be <laughs> a quantum physics thing I've done an exam. Um, and I can sometimes even tense over something like that for a good minute, you know? Um, but yeah, and, and definitely doing it in sports, definitely doing it in sports, you know? The sport is such a physical activity anyway, you know, it's strange that we have to then hold that in yeah. when we've been so physical, you know? It's, it's honestly, it's so interesting. I find it so interesting and I'd love to know, I'd love to know like the science behind it, but there's so much we don't know, but. It's you know, I was um, told them when I took my son because he stimmed before I talked about mine and, and the doctor at the time actually thought it was epilepsy. And I was like, it's not epilepsy. And he's done it since a baby. So it's not a learned mm -hmm. behavior because my daughter doesn't do it. Yeah. So it, is, it think, isn't a learned behavior. Yeah, well, I think that's the thing is, that, well, it's too, co like, it would be too much of a coincidence for it to be a learned behavior amongst a certain group of people. And it's very individual what you do anyway. It, it, yeah. It's very individual, you know. Mm. Yeah. It's just incredibly, it's incredibly fascinating. And yeah, considering it's, like you said, it's not a learned behavior, why on earth would we stop people from doing it? Um, and it doesn't hurt anyone. It just, no. I think, I think the thing is, is, is unfortunately society has a negative view of certain people, perhaps at the higher support end of the scale which is terrible but we can't beat around the bush it's true um and you might see the kind of stimming um amongst that population a little bit more because as i said they have, I mean, maybe have a slightly less awareness or uh 
maybe don't care as much what other people think but it means that other people try and suppress it and then it's kind of just labeled as a as a sort of a special behavior um, i'm not sitting on my hands anymore no mm. not doing it no good <laughs> i know i find myself something that i do is like i just fiddle with my hands a lot especially when i'm anxious and i it's so annoying because now i'm like i know i'm doing it and i'm if i'm in a meeting and i'm anxious and i'm just like <laughs> yes, yes. and you'll see like photos of me as well i'm always on the end and I like kind of look okay, maybe look a bit awkward. And then you like zoom down to my hand and my hand's like this. <laughs> That's where I've got all my tension has just gone to my hand. It's weird, it's the hand because I'm the same my hands like a claw. I do, but I don't know. Yeah. I can't do it. On, I just can't do it on demand. It's just not there right now. There's no, oh, no, no, yeah. No, it's weird, isn't it? It's like, yeah. But after this, I'm like, you're stewing after this. But yeah, it should be talked about more often and not hidden away and not embarrassed. And I said, especially in sports as well, you know, especially. Mm. Yeah. so what do you think um your autism has given you strengths wise in sport loads loads <laughs> and this is the thing look i have anxiety i have meltdowns and then i know this is a unique journey just for me but i love my brain and and i do i really really do um it's been a journey but it, it gives me such hyper focus it's incredible i do get frightened that the focus will stop sometimes because i know that happens and i don't want to like i don't fly planes anymore and that's just gone so i do always worry that it's going to end um and i keep an eye on that to keep things boundaryed now but it's given me such hyper focus it's given me incredible honesty with myself very honest so honest with my training so for example no one was there this morning doing those 10 500 meters i could have nipped that in the bud at seven when it really hurt and I did all 10. You know, there's no way I was lying to myself. So I do believe it gives me a great honesty. It gives me um, that rabbit hole capability to find out about everything and get really good at something. Um, patience, I would even say. I mean, I can literally get lost in physics. I can get lost in running. Um, real enthusiasm and passion and joy. Energy, I mean, the energy I have is incredible. My age, it's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon you know and I absolutely I love the fact that I analyze everything I think it's brilliant I love it I celebrate mm. my brain. I really do and mm. and, the, and the body it gives to my sport is great I was never given up because motivation as we all know is really weak. I mean I haven't even told you that I, I was so interested I went off and did a, a master's in sports psychology at Sterling Uni um and I'm specializing I know exactly I know I know and I'm not boasting I'm just saying this is how it works you understand you get it and it's like but I gave up after one year. I did one year and got my certificate for it because I was a little bit bored by it because nothing, it was a good course, but it was about motivation. And I'm like, why does everybody need to learn about motivation? There's no lack of motivation, you know? Mm -hmm. But then again, it wasn't aimed at, you know, autistic athletes or neurodiverse athletes that seem to have amazing motivation to do something they're passionate about, you know? Mm, I agree. I, I found like in sport that, a lot of the stuff that sports psychologists would advise was just incredibly irrelevant. And I just think it's purely because it's seen through one lens and it's probably irrelevant for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think one of the big steps that people could take in the sports sector and beyond is to make sure various perspectives are being considered and represented um, because not only are people being done a disservice and people kind of think, oh, it's, it's kind of boring, like it's not relevant to me, it's not the way I think, mm -hmm. but also I've come up against instances where it can be quite damaging and dangerous to give a person advice um, if it's from a different standpoint than yes. their neurology and their behaviour truly is. Um, so that's, I think that's incredibly important. Something else that you said that I just wanted to touch back on was you said that you were very happy with your brain <laughs> and I think that a lot of people will find it incredibly useful to hear that. And I would also like to second it. And I, I've read a few things on 
online recently there seems to be this big debate about should there be a cure for autism oh. uh, firstly i don't think you can cure something that has a thousand different combinations of causes mm -hmm. like autism is communication difficulties and repetitive behavior but the cause of that and the the intense complexity of the brain is going to be completely different for every single person there's no quick fix no. and then also how does that make autistic people feel like why don't we try changing our processes our approach society expectations and see how they get along then um and like there are lots of times in the past where i met i've, I've been i've in tears crying to my husband saying i wish i had a different brain why is my brain like this and like you know when you when you have a meltdown but i've not had a meltdown in three or four years now because i've been living in a way that is sustainable for me and i've not been trying to fit into this mold that i'm apparently supposed to fit into and so when i hear you know should there be a cure for this it breaks my heart and and yes, for some people who have like intense, um, I want to say like processing um, interference or something like that, or sensory issues, try and find a cure or something to alleviate that specific characteristic, but not a cure for autism in general. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing is to define the things that people find difficult separate to the autism. Well, isn't anxiety in, in, our, in the autistic world, autism plus environment equals anxiety? So instead of trying to cure the <laughs> autism, we need to be working on the environment and stop mm. this. I read a book, I'll deviate a little bit, but a, a book years ago, which was about, um, it's called The Happiness Industry. And it, it's about how in the 1970s, they used to work on marketing and advertising. It's a great book. But to do that, they had to group people together. And once mm. they group people together, they can promote to that group. And that's your mainstream, that, you know, and then that becomes, yeah. if you don't fit into that group, we can't advertise to you. We need to make you different from the group. And that's what I mean by the environment in a certain way. And then it becomes easier just to do everything for that certain environment, that certain group, and everybody else needs to be not factored into that. Mm. And, and that's really, really sad. And, and you're right. And I think the environment is the thing. Not trying to cure autism that's horrendous even saying that mm. but work on the environment and you're right I'm the same as you I work from home I work with my dogs around my feet now I train in the morning by myself I have a schedule I have a routine and I feel so incredibly healthy but I had to work that out for myself and I had to work out what's the yeah. environment that suits me I'm not going to go to an athletics club because it might work for somebody but it really doesn't work for me but it's having that confidence to realize that it's not going to work for you. Don't try and mold yourself like other people because that's what causes the meltdowns. And that's mm. what causes it. We try and force ourselves to go to the party or force ourselves to be in that group. And we need to have yeah. I think that comes with experience and, and learning. And, and obviously I'm old now. So I don't care what people think about me anymore. <laughs> you know, I want to be happy now. And well, I'm always happy, but I, I don't want to do anything to impress others, so I won't stick to the group. So yeah, let's let's focus on changing the environment in sports and everything, rather than changing the person. You know, that's incredibly mm. sad, isn't it? When you say that, I, I, my, my son's incredible. I know that's incredibly sad. Incredible. I get. I honestly, it, it like I sometimes I feel like commenting on the posts mm. and just saying by the way, this really, really upset me all day. Like I'll be thinking about it the rest of the day. Cause even though people might look at me and be like, oh, she's got it together. Like she doesn't have, you know, she doesn't struggle. She doesn't da da da. Like I'm, you know, not, not bad enough to be considered, um, like not bad enough to be relatable to the people who really struggle, not good enough to, be relatable to the people who fit in um but like yeah i i struggle on a daily basis like it's a f i feel like my i said this to my husband only yesterday i was like my brain is like a tight walking a tightrope like it's like perfect when it, it's in that middle place but one wrong movement either way and it's like ah i got you <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, 
And the catastrophizing thing. I mean, I cried with my boss this week. She won't mind me saying it. I've got an incredible boss. My boss is autistic. And I was able to say to her one day that I'd had a meltdown. And she was like, oh, how are you now? I was like, I slept last night. I feel fine now. Great, on you go. Yeah. Now, if I'd said that to a boss in, in my previous job who had no understanding of it, I had a meltdown. They'd be like, mm, everybody else keep an eye on her and she needs time off. Yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. And, and so the language I'm able to use is really colloquial as well. So I'm really safe in that world now as well. I can say meltdown yeah. and thinning and quiet time and yeah. the lights are too bright. And oh my gosh, that noise yeah. is really bad. You know, so yeah, I can do I've only, yeah, I, I totally agree. I've only just started to say words like meltdown um without connecting it to behavior in my head and to a suggestion that it's I don't know some kind of weakness or that it's self-inflicted or that I can just get over it it's just it's almost like okay I got the formula wrong that's how I see it I'm like oh, okay I need to okay I need to get over it right now which takes time and patience and self-understanding and then I will review my formula and I will tweak it and hopefully I will avoid the meltdown next time. That's how I see it. I love it's it. Like... Environment all along, you need to tweak that environment. Yeah. What was the environment that caused it? What went wrong there? Why was things mm. so traumatic tonight? What mm. was it about things was it took me over the edge? <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And then it will happen again, you know? And then, and yeah. then self-care as well, isn't it? Self-love and looking after yourself. And especially when we do like train so hard as well I mean we're pushing ourselves we're putting a lot of effort into that as well uh, and we're able to push those barriers that's another thing we're able to push those barriers and work harder than I think a lot of people can put up with but we need to make sure that we look after ourselves as well that's a big part of that too yeah I, I really agree about my brain I do love my, the only thing I would say is now and again I have been quoted as saying I wish I could turn the volume down on it a little bit that's the only thing I won't get rid of it but if I could just turn the volume down you know? Oh yeah, I get that a lot. I really do get that. Um, that's <laughs> finding noise cancelling headphones actually has like really changed my life. <laughs> it just turns the volume down a little bit. Um, I used to like, I used to be like, ah, oh, I'm really bad with new technology and like changing to use new technology. So it like took my husband buying these for me to start using them. And now I'm like, why did I not use them before? Okay. I used to just go, if I ever had to go to London, I would wear earplugs on the tube. <laughs> what? No, these are brilliant. Audibles, audibles, yeah. um, like podcasts and, and noise cancelling headphones, amazing. Yeah, it makes things really yeah. much more better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before we finish, I can talk to you forever. I know. <laughs> There's just more to edit. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> um, what do you think we can do to help those, you know, autistic, ADHD, dyslexic, dyspraxic kids who are at that point in school where you said you used to run around loads, but you didn't feel like you could get involved you felt like you would just get laughed at and so you kind of took yourself out of it how do we intervene at that point there's a few ideas i have which are personal though but things are like don't force people into team sports all the time look at solo sports i mean there's some incredible ultra runners that must have a similar mindset um you know look at I used to run laps around or walk laps around my playground by myself for hours. Why well, didn't nobody notice that? Say, she was running for hours. Because the best run mm. I ever did was four mile loop for eight hours as many times as you could. I was so happy, so excited for that race. So, why did no one notice that? So, I'd say let people look at independent sports, not always in teams, because they're not comfortable in a team. Um, it's not always the sport that's a problem, that's the social aspect. We need role models. We need people to talk about things we've talked about, like swimming and meltdowns. We need that language to come into everyday use um, so we can talk around it in sports as well. Um, and we can, I mean, I said to my coach, you know, I have issues with, with balance, uh, so proprioception. I can be touching a blade of grass with my little finger and I won't fall over running downhill. But if I'm not touching, I mean, that grass is doing nothing for my balance, but I need to feel earth. I need to feel connected to something because of, of all of that as well. And no one had talked about that. So I could run up hills all day long, but couldn't run down them. So we need to talk, we need to look about the sensory needs as well. We need to do sensory risk assessments on sports. So look at lights on tracks, are they really super bright? How noisy are they? If you're going to race, 
effort, you know, look at the preparation before a race, you know, do people have to stand around those in busy tents, you know, cross country races, is there a quieter tent that they could stand around and calm down? Can they put headphones on and stand in a quieter tent, you know, things like that. So there's loads of things that can be done at grassroots level, language, independent sports, um, things in races to allow people to be quiet beforehand, and then using the language every day. But then the big one for me is I shouldn't be doing this interview. It should be somebody that's achieved even bigger, better things than me, like yourself, but older and, and still doing better things that I can look up to and go, wow, they're incredible. And they can do that. It shouldn't be me. It shouldn't be me. There should be better role models out there that can be on my wall that I can look up to and go, amazing. I want to be like her. And there's a lot of her in that because there's a lot of male role models when we started there. Yeah. And things. But if I had a, an athlete who's a sports athlete who is open about being autistic, that'd be amazing. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, I do agree that like some of the bigger sports stars, it would be great if they could disclose. But at the same time, there's that part of me that's like, I'm, I just have this justice complex and I, I just don't believe that like anyone is better than anyone else. And it's all about the barriers that you overcome, not right. the level that you get to. So to hear you say that, I'm like, absolutely not. I would, <laughs> I would be interviewing you, you still. You have achieved high things. I grew up not seeing anybody achieve anything I could look. I would, I, I think I, I it's very personal. I haven't achieved what you've achieved. And it's interesting because my partner achieved a lot. He didn't need a role model, you know, he had that talent. I, I haven't got a huge talent. I've got a huge work capacity, brilliant lungs, brilliant heart, really good at really getting down and just mental toughness is awesome. But I haven't got a natural talent in the way I run and my cadence and without going through the biomechanics. But if I had a role model, it would have made a difference to me personally. And I do think it would make a difference if people could talk about it more. And so like, like even stimming and using language like that. Yeah. You know, well, I'm really excited to actually Put that bit out and have that out there and write about it as well because i think it's it's crucial and it's almost like a first in this sports arena anyway so you can claim that <laughs> <laughs> good um, <laughs> i'm happy yeah <laughs> is there anything else that you want to say before we end no we didn't touch on age either i think that's something else that needs to not be forgotten about older autistic women i mean i don't mind saying that i'm coming up to 50. And there seems to be a lot on children, how to get children into sports and things like mm. that. There needs to be a bit more on autistic older adults. There's not a lot of research into autism and menopause in sports or mm. older athletes in sports. And, and I think there's so much benefits for, for strength training and everything for, for older women anyway. But again, we need to talk about autistic older women in sport as well. Um, and then there's that's an extra barrier on top, you know, yeah. like massive running and massive sports. So yeah, yeah. just... Anybody out there who's in the 45 to 50 or 50 over category, don't come against me in high rocks, please, because I'm really going for that <laughs> title. Um, don't, just don't go near it. But, <laughs> but get into sports and don't think that you can't. I mean, I've, really been, I've never been as fit as I am in my entire life at 48. Never, never. Don't mind saying it, I've got a six pack. Never had one before. <laughs> Take me 48 years to get one. I love it. It's incredible. I feel so strong. You know, now when I put my wrist guards on, I can be Wonder Woman. Do you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, don't think age is a barrier as well. So that's what I just like to get out there. I love that. That's <laughs> a really great message to end on. Um, but it's been really, really lovely to talk to you. And <laughs> I'll definitely keep an eye on your progress and make sure you keep us updated as well. Um, so thank you very much for talking. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>